everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Sunday Assembly Los Angeles. Woo! We're really excited to get started today. My name is Hannah. I'm Anthony. And we're married to each other. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We've so. been married for about 12 years. We have two awesome kids right there in the second row. Raise your hands, children. Our children. <laughs> Only two of those were ours. Yeah. And um, our son turned 12 a couple days ago, and he got himself an iPhone. Yeah. So at any moment, if you want to come hug us, because we're Console barely able to us. handle it. We have a preteen with a cell phone now. Yeah, it, it hurt. <laughs> but again, welcome to Sunday Assembly Los Angeles. We are a God-free community that celebrates a worldview grounded in evidence and reason. We invite everyone to join us as we do our best to live, live better, better, help, help often, often, and, and wonder, wonder more. more. So we're going to get this Sunday assembly started with some great music. Woo! I want to invite the Wondermore Warblers onto the stage, back by popular demand. Here comes the Warblers. <laughs> sing along, and we want you all to sing along too. Anyone can warble with us, so if you're like feeling moved by the music, just come join us on stage. Back for their sixth appearance at Sixth Sala. time. Hunter and the Dirty Jacks are the band. How you guys doing Woo! this morning? How you guys doing this morning? All right, stand up with us. Come on, get on your feet with us. All right, we're going to start out with the Creedence song. Here we go. Mountain 
of knowledge where it's forbidden to go. See the light in the hips, I know this lady of flame. The moment I saw her, it was clear why I came. This is a daughter of Zeus, though it's clearly the eyes. Sunday Assembly, San Diego. Where are you at? Look at that. Thank you for coming to LA. Beating the traffic. We also have a lot of visitors from Orange County. Where are you at, Orange County? Look at that. We even have a gentleman from Las Vegas, Mr. William. Thank you for coming. And to all our new guests, thank you for coming to Sunday Assembly. I want to uh, congratulate Sarah Sandberg. She's starting a kick-ass job on Monday. And you can talk to her about that, but it really is kick-ass. Here's, here's how kick-ass it is. She starts her first day in Las Vegas. She flies to Las Vegas. <laughs> $2,000 in chips, all the drinks she wants. That's her Monday morning. Uh, Terry Smith has been working really hard to uh, start a secular student alliance. And last September she started that with uh, Pasadena City College. The group was officially recognized by the SSA in January and officially chartered by the college on February 5th. It has, yes, 
Thank you. It has 12 students and Sarah Barker as faculty advisor, and they're all ready to go. Okay, so we got two big ones here. Uh, William Enlow, where are you at, William Enlow? Are you around here? Hey, Look at right that here. guy. Look at this here, guy. come up here. Yeah, go ahead, dude. Get used to this. So, uh, come up here. William Enlow, who's here into art? Who does art or graphics or creative stuff? Musicians, you all know how hard it is oh, to win right. anything. This is a creative community. This buddy won an international competition against 200,000 other boys and girls of the Boys and Girls Club of the world. He's nine years old. He competed against kids up to 18 years old, and he won. Woo! Congratulations, William. He's even got the shirt to prove. And if you can clap just as hard for this next one, it's just as big. Amy and Michael just celebrated 10 years together. Woo! Congratulations, you guys. Share. Anybody have anything awesome? Right there. Okay. Stand up. You're just feeling awesome today? Yeah? Yeah, we That is something to celebrate. And then again, my son, um, our son, Mick, like Mick Jagger, and actually he's Mick Richards, like Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, so he has the most amazing rock and roll trivia. It'd be some amazing science, too. <laughs> he's 12 years old now and a proud iPhone owner, so let's Congratulations, Mick. All right. Anybody else? Milestones? I don't want to miss anybody. We have one? We have two? So the band, Hunter and the Dirty Jacks, just signed with the largest indie record label in the world. Uh, how long ago? Uh, the, the important date is this spring. They're going to release our first album called Single Barrel. Wow. It's going to go out glo global distribution and all kinds of things. And uh, you know what? It's commemorating such, we've got some shows to promote for y'all, and we've got tickets back here at the table. We have, you know what? We got a one show a week from this Friday in Hermosa Beach. There's a bunch of West Siders that are saying, "Hey, when are you gonna play over here again?" A week from this coming Friday in Hermosa Beach at St. Rock, we're gonna be headlining with the Stone Foxes from San Francisco. Oh, we got tickets. Discount tickets for y'all today. Enough milestones for us. Thank you. Thank you, Hunter. And Congratulations. If you're of age, I would suggest you buy their album with a nice bottle of whiskey, yes. right? Single barrel, tribute to the name. And uh, as a musician, I would definitely recommend listening to it every Sunday as early as possible. <laughs> it's a good way to wake Start up. It'll name. make you feel awesome. All right, Sunday Assembly LA Kids will now convene in the kids' room across the driveway. Anyone who wants to participate, you can take your kids to meet one of our caregivers in the lobby and then rejoin us when they're settled. This is just a courtesy to you. You do not have to bring your children out there. They're welcome to stay in here with us, but uh, feel free to take advantage of it. So our item drive this month was for the Burbank Animal Shelter. We're yes. Burbank local, so we're pretty happy. Go Burbank. <laughs> There's a lot of animals in Burbank. <laughs> Next month we'll be collecting for our homegrown service project, the Sunday Assembly Line. This project is entirely in-house and it will involve creating care kits with toiletries, other needs, personal items for the homeless, and in our community. We will distribute these care kits personally next month. And we'll also invite you to bring dry goods food items next, next Sunday Assembly for our ongoing drive with the West Side Food Bank, battling food insecurity and hunger in Los Angeles. icebreaker and we had a hard time figuring out one that was we thought creative and fun and so Gina just put us in our place and so this icebreaker is a very personal one um, it's 
prolonged eye contact. This is our theme this month is building trust. We're going to do something that might make you a little bit uncomfortable. So you're going to look for somebody hopefully you don't know. And we're going to put 60 seconds either on the screen or someone's going to have to put it on a clock. But we'll count. Try to look. It's okay to laugh, but just try to look at the other person in the center of their eyes. Look at their nose. Just look at See what you can learn about them in 60 seconds. See what you can learn about them. Okay, we'll give you a minute to choose a partner and then we'll start the clock. I'm going to choose Hannah. <laughs> Next, we'd like to welcome up Sava Ellis. She's going to share a reading. Sava, where are you? There she comes. can make it out here alone. Alone, all alone, nobody, but nobody can make it out here alone. There are some millionaires with money they can't use. Their wives run round like banshees, their children sing the blues. They've got expensive doctors to cure their hearts of stone, but nobody, no, nobody can make it out here alone. Alone, all alone, Nobody, but nobody, can make it out here alone. Now, if you listen closely, I'll tell you what I know. Storm clouds are gathering, the wind is going to blow. The race of man is suffering, and I can hear the moan. Because nobody, but nobody, can make it out here alone. Alone, all alone. Nobody, but nobody can make it out here alone. My Angela, alone. Thank you so much, Sava. And that goes with the theme for today, building trust, um, as well as that icebreaker exercise we did. I kind of thought it might be awkward, but I'm really excited about how well that went. Everybody didn't even want to stop talking to each other. <laughs> So it's good. I think that we're doing a good job at building trust in this room. So um, we're going to welcome Paul up. Yes, you remember Paul. To help us build trust outside of this room. He has done multiple musical appearances with us. He's from the Sunday Assembly, San Diego. He's a resident song leader. He's a career songwriter, song leader, music director, recording engineer, slash producer, audio, audio systems designer, and I'm sure a lot more that wouldn't fit on here. He was raised in Sherman Oaks and spent the better part of 40 years in Southern California as a professional church music director, itinerant song leader, business owner, husband, and father. Today he's sharing some of his experiences growing up in Southern California during the Cold War. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Good morning. <laughs> All right, so I'd like to say good morning, LA! It all started in 1953. Eisenhower and his Vice President Richard Nixon, you didn't know that, <laughs> were inaugurated. Stalin died, that was a huge global thing. The Yankees beat the Dodgers. <laughs> yeah, I know. The Russians detonated a hydrogen bomb. We had detonated a hydrogen bomb the year before so they were catching up. 
Hydrogen bombs, for those of you who weren't into higher level nuclear weaponry, were worse than regular atomic bombs. And I was born. I grew up in Sherman Oaks, right over the hill, right down around the base of the hill. This is our house, this is a little place that says our house. This is my family. I tried to pick the worst picture I could find of us, especially my sister in the middle. I was the oldest of four. And this was my boogeyman. From the time I started to go to elementary school, I learned that nuclear war was not only an if, it was a when. And there was this. And it was a real thing. And so we played ball on the streets, and we hung around and we did things, but every now and again we would remind ourselves that the Russians were going to get us. It was a time of the Cold War. The Cold War was a time that started right after World War II and went up to about 1991 when the Soviet Union disintegrated. The Cold War was mostly between the Russians and the United States. Here's the quick summary. We were afraid of communism. They hated capitalism. The Soviets were expansionist and they were determined with a stated uh, intent to spread communism. America was afraid of the Soviet nuclear attack, and guess what? The Russians were afraid of an American nuclear attack because at that time, the only people who'd ever used one in war. <laughs> Suspicion led to mutual distrust. Both sides kept building more and more bombs and showing off. Nuclear testing, and then there were spies, and there was everything, and I was a child. But I learned this term, MAD. Anybody know what MAD means? Mutually assured destruction. What that meant was by the time I was old enough to pay attention, we knew that if one of us attacked the other, that we had enough automatic systems in place to wipe out the other country if they did this. Because Russians were going to get us. So I went to elementary school, and we had a film by the Civil Defense Administration, and it was this guy named Bert the Turtle. Bert the Turtle had his own protective hard shell, but of course, we were human beings. We didn't have that. And so at some point in time, we would need to learn to find shelter. Not if, but when. We were told about the atomic bomb. It's a new danger. We were told all about going to Find a shelter. This is an actual civil defense fallout shelter sign from an old fallout shelter. And that's where we had to go. But you see, elementary school kids were smarter than everybody else. We knew that a child's desk would protect us from the bomb. <laughs> and so we would have duck and cover drills. And so we'd be sitting in class in second or third grade, and the teacher would go, Drop! And we were trained as children to hit the deck, go under the thing, pull our head, and it was not about earthquakes. Because? The Russians are coming. So, on the last Sunday, or the, I mean the last Friday of every month at 10 o'clock, they would fire these big machines off. And I had a sound effect, but we're just going to skip it for now. Um, air raid sirens. The last Friday of the month, 10 o'clock, like clockwork. And we would make our way to a fallout shelter if that siren came at some other time. Now, if I were going to attack a major city in the United States, I'd do it at 10 o'clock on the last Friday of the month. It just made more sense to me. But I was a nine-year-old, what did I know? So down here in this circle, that's my house. And then <clears throat> if you walk three blocks up there, on the corner of Beverly Glen and Ventura Boulevard was the Sherman Oaks United Methodist Church, and actually the Sherman Oaks Methodist Church at the time, and they had a fellowship hall that had a big steel door in it. And so it was kind of a de facto fallout shelter. It was the closest thing. But also on the corner of Beverly Glen and Ventura Boulevard, they sold these. 
It was before Fat Burger went up. They sold these. These were fallout shelters. You could dig a hole in your backyard, put one of these in there. You could even get uh, FHA funding to have one of these holes dug in your backyard to put these in. And you'll still occasionally find houses in the valley. This was a big pool company in LA, Catholic Pools, and they also sold fallout shelters because the Russians were gonna get us. And this is your family down in your fallout shelter. I like the plumbing over here on the left. And here we are, another picture with dad in a tie, mom in a dress, because that's what Leave it to Beaver looked like in a fallout shelter. Life Magazine, which was a huge periodical of the time, was even talking about the drive for mass fallout shelters, which was insane to me as a kid. Why didn't we just figure out how to not blow each other up? It seemed to me that that would be better, but I was just 10, and what did I know? The Russians were going to get us. The Russians had a bad guy. His name was Nikita Khrushchev. Nikita Khrushchev banged his shoe on the podium at the United Nations and said, I will bury you! Actually, he never really did that. That was propaganda. It wasn't true. But we all believed that. He was the bad guy. We had a good guy. We had JFK. JFK and Khrushchev had the proverbial button. You know, if somebody pushes the button, what happens when somebody pushes the button? This was a thing that was part of language that I heard as a child. My friends would talk about, what are you going to do when somebody pushes the button when the war comes? Well, we've got a fallout shelter in our backyard. Well, we're going to go down to here. Some of us said, well, we're just going to sit on the porch and watch the fireworks. Khrushchev and Kennedy were duking it out, and it was getting pretty tense. Because Russians are going to get us. So here's my family. Now, my family, we lived in Sherman Oaks. We lived in our home. My dad was uh, an administrator at UCLA. He was also in charge of the Peace Corps, very early Peace Corps out of UCLA. My dad was a very smart man. My mother was a very smart woman. And they believed in people. And they believed in negotiating. And they believed in working out problems without violence. And that's what they taught me in my house. No, hey, Shelly. Uh, yeah, that's what they taught me in my house. They taught me we work things out, we don't fight. I also lived in this house, and across the street we had a doctor. So if we fell down, skinned our knees, old Doc Wally would patch us up. Next door to Doc Wally we had a TV star. Noah Berry Jr. lived next door. He lived across the street from us, and his son had a go-kart, he used to drive us around, and we had a great old time. But we also had the Russian lady. So now we're kids, and we've got, the Russians are going to get us. Then I go home, and the Russians aren't going to get us, because we're going to work stuff out. And across the street is the Russian lady. I never knew her name. She was the Russian lady. And she was really, really nice. And her husband was really, really nice. And they had a big dog, and it was really, really nice. <laughs> Everybody about the Russian family were nice. They didn't want to get us. If the Russians came and got us, they'd get the Russian lady too. I was 10, it didn't make sense to me. I also was a big folk music fan from, his long, from the earliest sound I ever heard in my life. And folk singers like Pete Seeger and Woody Guthrie and Odetta and Mahalia Jackson and the Kingston Trio, they, they were singing songs that said things like, listen folks, here is my thesis, peace in the world or the world in pieces. So I had the Russian lady and I had the folk singers, but went outside that neighborhood, the Russians are going to get me. October 1962 was the Cuban Missile Crisis. It was the closest we ever came to nuclear war, in my opinion. Went something like this. Fidel Castro would have taken over Cuba, and uh, he had turned it into a communist country, so he became friends with Khrushchev. Cuba had become a communist country. In 1961, the CIA and their minions went over there and tried to um, assassinate Castro. So he wasn't going to be trusting us. So he asked the Russians for help. The Russians sent 144 ships 
loaded with nuclear weapons and systems to support them to Cuba. Probably kind of overkill, but Khrushchev's going, yeah, I can get 90 miles off the coast of Florida with our missiles. The missiles, by the way, that were not strong enough to hit California from, from Cuba at that time. But I didn't know that. So we sent our Navy out to stop their ships. It was in the papers. Blast the Reds of Castro attacks. And the Russians actually used the term, blockade is a step to nuclear war. They said it out loud. So we all watched the president see what he had to say. And people went to the grocery stores and panicked. And they cleared the shelves. And I remember going to the store with my mom for milk. And I looked at people with full carts and the shelves looking like this. And I said, Mom, are we going to do that? She goes, no, honey. She said, I think President Kennedy's going to take care of this. We're going to be okay. Okay. Cool, Mom. Thanks. And even though everybody was telling me the Russians were going to get me, I wanted to believe my mom. So I did. And everybody else, the Russians are going to get us, and they were going to get us. This is an iconic picture of President Kennedy struggling during that time. And when it was all said and done, this is November now, that happened in October, it passed. And the Russians didn't get us. I used to go to the church down there in Sherman Oaks, the one that was the fallout shelter, but I went there because it was the church and I liked the music a lot. As I got older, I liked the girls and the music a lot. And um, what did the church say about the Russians? Well, my church didn't say much about the Russians. They really didn't talk about the Soviets or anything like that, but there was a guy when I was in junior high who was a student at Cal State Northridge named Daryl. Daryl was the youth director for the middle school, or, or what we called junior high back then. And Daryl was great. We loved Daryl. He was the coolest guy. He was so much fun. He used to take us places, and we did stuff. And one day I went to youth group, and Daryl wasn't there anymore. There was somebody else there. And I said, what happened to Daryl? They go, oh, well, Daryl's not here anymore. So I went home and asked my mom, and my dad was on the board of trustees of that church. And uh, my mom said, well, honey, Daryl? Daryl was a student at Northridge, and he was, he was told to go by one of his classes to a meeting of a group. And somebody saw him go to this meeting of this group, and it was a communist suspect group. And so they decided that he was a communist, and they fired him. Because... Okay. So what happened to my boogeyman? Well, Khrushchev died in 71, never got us. We all know what happened to him. But in the next 20 years or so, we spent an enormous amount of time and resources and scientific brain power and money trying to build things to shoot down missiles from outer space. At the same time, the Russians had this problem at Chernobyl. You might have heard about it. And what they discovered as a result of Chernobyl was that they didn't even need to put rockets underneath their warheads. All they had to do was blow them up in Siberia somewhere, and they'd be pouring out milk in Finland the next day. That's how insane it got. So who's going to get you now? Hmm? Who's going to get you now? The Cold War was real, and the Cold War was manufactured. What's manufactured now? Who are they telling us to be afraid of? Fear is where we live. When we, when we live in fear, we miss the beauty. That's what my parents taught us. So just real quickly, take my Cold War thing, take that out, put in war on terrorism, take out communism, put in Islamic terrorists. Right? Radical Muslims, Sharia law, Islamic terror attack. They're afraid of more American attacks. We're afraid of them. Does any of this look familiar? What about Syrian refugees? Are they going to get us now? They would have us believe that. How about children from Central America? Are they going to get us now? My parents taught me whenever possible, be a safe place for others. They also taught me not to believe everything I hear. <laughs> and for that, I greatly appreciate it. My dad turned 90 yesterday. I had a chance to thank Dad for that. I told him I was coming here to do this talk. And 
So anyway, that's what I learned about that. By the way, I grew up in the 60s. I graduated from Van Nuys High in 1970. It was the 60s. People were really into drugs. Did you know that up on Selma and Wilcox, there was a place called the Bazaar Bazaar where you could buy LSD coffee <laughs> until 1967? It was legal. But I wasn't into drugs. I was into booze. Nothing like a $2 jug of Red Mountain under the Santa Monica Pier, chug it down, waking up in your own vomit the next morning. It was glorious. <laughs> But as I got older, I still liked booze. And I kept liking booze for a very long time, but what I really, really liked was vodka. So I guess when it was all said and done, <laughs> Okay, Castro, he's still alive. He's still down there not bothering anybody. Uh, and by the way, day before yesterday, I thought this was a beautiful irony. The US and Russia announced a mutual plan to help humanitarian aid in Syria. How about that? Things change. I remember like yesterday, October 1962. There was panic in the city. Nobody knew quite what to do. As we stood there in the grocery, folks bought up everything around. There were some missiles down in Cuba. Takes the edge off, so they 